Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. Thanks for joining us for our January CIS case conference webinar. Um, we have two very interesting cases to share with you, everybody, and one very quick brief journal overview. Um, and we'll get started. We have two great senior mentors. We have Jennifer Puck from UCSF and Gigi from the NIH. Um, and we're going to get started with our first presentation, which is um, being presented by one of our HEMOC fellows, Paige DePriest, um, here at my university, Medical University of South Carolina. Our senior mentor is Jennifer Puck at UCSF. And she's going to present a case of undetectable Trexton with uh, in a baby with multiple congenital anomalies. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just need this. The slides just aren't moving forward completely. Sorry. Um, yep. There we go. I don't know if that was me or somebody else. So I'm getting started talking about our patient. Um, this little girl came to be known to us on 16 days of life. Um, she was born at 32 weeks to a G3 P3 mother who had a history of type 2 diabetes, um, oligohydramnios, and premature rupture of membranes. She was a large for gestational age premature female thought to be secondary to the type 2 diabetes. Maternal labs were negative with the exception of being GBS positive, for which mom received appropriate antibiotics. She did have limited prenatal care and actually did not present to her physician until 23 weeks along. Um, so had not received care up until that time. Prenatal workup had been um, notable for ventricular megaly. And then following birth, the NICU workup identified further abnormalities that included ventricular megaly, a very large PDA with a PFO as well. She had complete left renal agenesis. She had multiple rib abnormalities, and that included hemivertebrae, and then she also had fused ribs um, with associated scoliosis most prominent in the lumbar region. She also had several um, endocrine anomalies with hypoparathyroidism that was quite marked um, and associated hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, and vitamin D deficiency. Her additional workup that the NICU had already performed prior to our consult, she had a normal karyotype, 46XX. She had a normal microarray. They were obviously initially concerned for DeGeorge, given the presentation, um, but was negative. She did have an initial newborn screen that was sent and just resulted with the trek being inconsistent. And then on her second repeat, newborn screen actually was noted to have an abnormal trek. Um, and the RN... ACE P of 23.38 confirmed the validity of the abnormal check. Important additional history. So mom um, had a history of, like I mentioned earlier, the type 2 diabetes and the late prenatal care. What was interesting, she also had a history of multiple miscarriages, though none of us could confirm that documentation um, as per the chart. That was just per mom's report. Only autoimmune History in the family was a great-grandmother with lupus. She had two full siblings. One was a one-year-old brother that had had some jaundice with hyperbilly at birth that quickly resolved. And then she has a brother that actively has an RSV infection at home. There was no other significant known past medical history within the family. Nobody had any known immunodeficiencies, immune disorders, or severe infections um, in a young child, young person. Um, and there were no known history of any congenital defects additionally too. So mom denied any, but a young babies in the family, et cetera, being born with any prolonged hospitalizations, NICU stays, surgeries, et cetera. Her social history was a little bit complicated and actually it was sometimes difficult um, to get full history from the family. Mom was reachable by phone, um, but mom and dad were staying at home um, because of the family members with RSV and not wanting to expose the child. I'm going to pause you right, well, we'll do this slide and then I'll pause you um, and we can talk about differential, but you can give the, the presentation first. 
So when we initially went to examine her, her vital signs were stable for age. She was requiring um, a half a liter nasal cannula at the time, just for intermittent episodes of um, apnea or brief DSATs um, that were thought to be related to her premature age. Pertinent things that stood out to us, her skin. So she did have some erythema of her face and chest, but no significant palpable rash. Um, There was no evidence of skin desquamation or breakdown. She did have a marked diaper rash with um, erythema and some mild skin breakdown. Her mouth was notable for mild retronathia, and then she did have a borderline high arched palate. Important negatives on her physical exam, her head shape despite the ventriculomegaly. Um, She had a normal um, head shape. She had a uh, anterior fontanelle that was soft and flat, as well as a posterior fontanelle that was soft and flat. And then um, she had normal palpable openings along her suture lines. She didn't have any alopecia and her face had no obvious dysmorphic features at all. She did have the nasal cannula in place again on a half a liter. Um, she had associated intermittent tachypnea, but again, that was assumed, um, secondary to her premature age. And then on her abdomen, she had a soft umbilical stump that never had any active drainage or bleeding, but was present for a prolonged period of time. Okay, so for my attendees, like what um, what should be on our differential for uh, a baby with an abnormal or undetectable tract and multiple congenital abnormalities, um, aside from the George, which was already mentioned? Okay, we have CHARGE syndrome was also suggested. Um, anything else we think of with all of those rib abnormalities? Um, Carl's suggesting maybe some drug teratogenicity from like metformin for mom. And I actually don't recall what mom's meds were for her type two diabetes. Um, but I did get a, a detailed history from um, for, there were no immunosuppressants or prednisone or anything. Luis is saying RNU4ATAC, which I'm going to go to OMM for right now. Um, anybody else have any other suggestions? Okay. So this is small nuclear RNA, U-A-A-T-A-C, small nuclear. It's usually associated with microcephaly, osteodysplasia, primordial dwarfism. Um, I am looking, but Louise, can you tell me if you know um, about the T-cell abnormality or lymphocyte stuff that's associated with that? Carl's also suggesting possible omens, um, which would go with, it can go with low treks, but not all the other um, congenital abnormalities. And Neiman breakage syndrome was also suggested. Um, I see that there was a question, but for some reason it's not popping up. Um, Diabetic embryo embryopathy. So that is um, okay. Um, that is definitely a possibility. Um, and sorry, um, Carl. I think it was you who suggested metformin. Mom was on metformin. Um, our hemoc attending is also on the this webinar and just looked in the chart for us. Um, so mom was on metformin. Um, and then ADA with rib abnormalities, um, definitely on the differential as well. Okay. So I think that's a pretty good, um, list of things to consider. Um, PAX1 mutations was also suggested by Eric. DNA ligase 4. I think we have some good, uh, skid variants that have been suggested. Why don't you continue, Paige? Okay. 
So next for her, we did obtain some immunology labs. Her phenotype came back as T negative, B positive, NK positive. So she had undetectable CD3, CD4, CD8. Her B cells were detectable in greater than 1,000, and her NK cells were detectable um, at 610 um, cells per microliter. We um, sent her track to Mayo that showed that she only had 26 um, CD3 cells, 15 CD4 cells, and 6 CD8 cells. Her serum immunoglobulins were within normal limits for age. Her IgE, her, just one thing, we should have put this on there too, but the IgE was normal. It was less than, I think, 25. Her CBC, so she actually had normal platelets at birth. And then on day of life 16, which was the day of the initial immunology consult, they were noted to be dropping down to 58,000. She actually got um, as low as 20,000. Um, however, this spontaneously resolved completely on her own without intervention, but it was persistently low for several days, several um, continuous um, lab draws without any obvious etiology. We were able to send T cell subsets, the first of which um, was undetectable. Um, the second revealed a CD4 count of 17, um, with 747 CD4 positive T cell events. She had 1%. Um, RA, and the 90%, 99% RO um, memory cells. We also did um, a lymphocyte proliferation. And the first test actually was just insufficient volume, but we were able to send a second sample that essentially was limited by the low number of cells and just poor cell viability. And that was only looking able to, or predominantly looking for PHA because it just, they couldn't, that was the focus of it. Um, and then they, they said that they were able to try and do P PWM, but um, mainly because it just, with that few T cells, it took so much volume. Other things that we were thinking about that helped us in our workup, we obtained a chest ultrasound that did show a small but present thymus. And then we were able to finally obtain maternal CMV. She was IgG negative, um, but surprisingly, the infant was IgM negative, but IgG positive, which was interesting. Her urine culture was negative, and actually her serum CMV PCR just came back today and was negative. We eventually were able to send and got results back on a primary immunodeficiency panel, which did not identify any clinically relevant genetic mutations though there was um, a pathogenic variant identified in CASP-8. Um, however, it was a heterozygous, not um, homozygous, and so should not be causing the degree of symptoms or explain what was going on with this infant. We also were able to send whole exome sequencing this past Friday, and it is currently pending, looking for any other genetic cause. So things since evolving after that initial evaluation of this baby, she did develop a marked diffuse um, erythematous maculopapular rash. It was palpable and obviously concerning um, for any evidence of maternal engraftment. The skin biopsy was read as perivascular dermatitis with spongiosis and interface injury acute to subacute with background CD1A cells noted. Derm felt it was consistent with maternal engraftment versus a drug reaction. In regards to the drug reaction, she had not had any significant medications given around the time the rash developed that would have easily explained or triggered the phenomenon that we appreciated. So how is this infant doing currently? Um, so she's currently admitted to our service. From a neuro perspective, she has been stable with ventricular megaly essentially unchanged since birth. Neurosurgery is following closely. Cardiovascular, her PDA has closed. She does still have a PFO, and we're following with serial echoes, but she's been hemodynamically stable. Respiratory, she's been stable on room air. We were able to take her off caffeine, and she's had no further apneic events, now at a corrected age of close to 38 weeks. She, from a GI perspective, is tolerating her NG tube feeds. 
She still has extremely uncoordinated suck, minimal interest in taking PO um, per speech. And despite her prematurity is not advancing developmentally from a oral motor perspective as speech therapy would anticipate. Endocrine. Um, sorry, two quick questions. Carl's asking if she's still intermittently intercipnic and the answer there is no. Correct. And then um, Gigi's asking about um, a CMA test. Um, Gigi, do you want to, um, can you uh, clarify your question? Yeah, so, yeah, my, yeah, I mean, obviously, when you have multiple syndromic fissures, um, you can always contemplate the possibility that there might be a contiguous gene syndrome. Okay. So multiple genes been missing. And so doing a chromosome microarray might actually help identify areas. Oh, sorry. So she she so she had a chromosome microarray done initially. Okay. Yes. And it was negative. Yeah, it was negative. Was normal. Thank you. Yeah. Getting back to her systems review to where she is now, endocrine-wise, she's still requiring supplementation for her hypoparathyroidism. Renal, she is a single kidney, and so she is getting a repeat ultrasound, and should she eventually need transplant, would need a GFR to evaluate the function of that kidney. Um, her BUN and creatinine um, and renal function thus far has been stable as per her age. Um, from an infectious disease perspective, she's on in Bactrim and Fluconazole for prophylaxis. And then she has already received her Synergis and will receive her second one in February. And we since have her on reverse isolation. The family has had limited visitation given the RSV status at home. Heme, her thrombocytopenia has resolved. Her anemia has resolved. Her CBC most recently yesterday was stone cold normal. From a BMT perspective, we did send HLA typing on the infant and family. The infant's um, typing has returned, and there was a um, search run on her HLA typing just um, in working up her ongoing evaluation for potential need for a transplant. And then from a um, skin perspective, her rash was very concerning for maternal engraftment. Um, it has since um, improved greatly given um, our dermatology team working hard to increase her steroid and um, general lubrication regimen, um, and is almost entirely resolved on a two and a half percent hydrocortisone. She also had a severe diaper rash and, um, she has very sensitive skin re requiring Q one hour. Vapor chamber. Yes. Oh, can I just ask you, you said maternal engraftment here. Did you actually demonstrate maternal engraftment or is that still in the differential and not yet proven? Sorry. So you mean from like the HLA status? Is that what no, you're saying? well, I'm I'm wondering, uh, does the baby have maternal cells in her blood? Yes. So the HLA typing did not show maternal, uh, like a, a third um, type. However, the chimerism is out, and um, the pathologist just said that based on the. Um, it looks different than GVHD, but based on pathological description of maternal engraftment, this could be this description of what they see could also be consistent with maternal engraftment. That's what it said. So it's still uh, presumed, but not yeah. proven. Presumed. But that's a, yeah. an extremely important point. Correct. Because if you actually have maternal engraftment, um, then this really would fall under the uh, definition of typical skid. And you'd expect it to need uh, definitive therapy for for resolution. And so the chimerism is pending, but that yes, presumed. Sorry about that. I should have included presumed since it was our leading working differential diagnosis. Um, and so someone also commented that balanced translocations and inversions would not be detected by microarray, and that is indeed true. Yeah, I just want to mention that uh, some of the sequencing companies give you copy number with um, the the um, panels that they do. And so um, you should check on whatever company this was, because uh, if there's haploinsufficiency, then you can tell it right, right that way. Um, you're talking about for for the just the gene panel that we already did? Yes. 
Yeah, I can pull that up. Um, but I don't recall that. Well, I, let's go on because we're running short of time. Um, okay. That's just a, a side point. Okay, so, and then another, another point, you mentioned that there um, was hypoparathyroidism. And so that, of course, raises the question of, could this be a form of DeGeorge syndrome? And what is the function of the thymus? And that's also very important because um, you could have a DeGeorge syndrome without a identified DeGeorge mutation. And that may not get better with a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, it might need a thymus transplant. So, so that has to um, sort of be on your radar. I did talk to mom about the uh, thymus transplants at one point. Um, um, but then with the small thymus found on ultrasound, um, I told her that at least that part was a little bit reassuring, although the baby's not um, I mean, there aren't that many uh, T cells immigrating out. Um, I'm TV's not actually... reassured by that small thymus. Okay. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't know if it's functioning. Um, okay, Gigi's asking about hearing loss, and the answer is uh, no normal hearing loss. No. Okay, Paige, do you just want to finish this part up so we can maybe have a little more discussion? Sure. So looking, I think, into the literature, we found a case report of an infant born sorry, to a mom. If there's any role for I'm sorry? Sorry, continue. I just, when we were looking into the literature, seeing, obviously the big question is we don't have an obvious um, genetically identified good diagnosis yet. And so looking into the literature at other alternatives, um, in terms of could this be a secondary lymphopenia, there was a case report of a um, male infant born to a mother with gestational diabetes that had a very similar presentation, multiple musculoskeletal abnormalities, had consistent endocrine abnormalities with a hypoparathyroidism and hypocalcemia. Um, this infant did have liver involvement, and we have yet to see that in this infant. And this infant also had no thymus, um, but also did have the severe T-cell lymphopenia. And in this baby, the T-cells improved with time. And so we're increasing by day of life 175. That infant also had no genetically identified um, abnormality on the um, primary immunodeficiency um, panel. And so I think the question for all of us has been in working this baby up for primary versus secondary lymphopenia, thinking about genetics, need for transplant, or watching and waiting given our differential diagnosis. Dr. Puck, would you like to comment okay. on that? Well, uh, so of course I know what this is, right? <laughs> um, I think this is a very rare and very interesting case. And um, as I already alluded to, I think one of the things when you see uh, almost absent or absent uh, T cells and no trex is to think about whether this is a thymic problem or a uh, hematopoietic cell intrinsic problem, or it could be both. Um, and so I, I would not rush to transplant without um, doing a couple of things. One is waiting a little while to see if T cells start to rise. Um, and if that is true, then, then uh, maybe things can straighten out and there might be a problem with a thymus, but it might be that enough uh, lymphocytes can squeeze out uh, over time that things will improve. The other thing is, is uh, Gigi Notarangelo, who's, uh, who is here uh, with us, um, does have a research assay for thymic um, function or thymic capability, which can be done with a um, bone marrow sample from which he derives stem cells. And I don't know if you want to briefly describe that, Gigi. Yeah, so very briefly, um, basically there is a very powerful assay where you take CD34 positive cell from bone marrow 
can even be done with peripheral blood, CD34 positive cells. And then those are cultured on uh, an artificial thymic organoid in vitro. And actually, we see beautiful differentiation up to mature uh, CD3 positive TCR alpha beta or TCR gamma delta positive cells in uh, four to six weeks. So obviously, if the problem is hematopoietic intrinsic, you see a block in T cell development. Uh, on the other hand, if it is a thymus problem, then you see no problem with the capacity of those CD34 positive cells to become mature T cells. So that would really help in uh, defining what would be the best approach uh, to treatment in such cases. Okay. How much blood do you need for that? <laughs> we could totally... We so could bone, marrow, bone, bone marrow, uh, so we, 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 my group does it only with bone marrow, okay. uh, and it doesn't take much bone marrow. It takes as little as 3 ml of bone marrow blood. Uh, Elia Dad does it also with uh, peripheral blood. Um, uh, I think it takes also 3 to 5 ml. The, the only problem is that we, we, if you do it with bone marrow, you can also do, let's say you do find a block in development, you can sort those cells at that stage, do RNA-seq and compare results with what you see from normal donor cells at the same stage of differentiation. That may help identify the gene defect. Okay. And then with the concept of maternal engraftment, if the chimerism shows maternal well, engraftment... You, you, we you don't really see, at the CD34 uh, positive level, you don't really see um, contamination by maternal cells. Okay. So that would not be an issue. Because you purify the CD34, you don't use the whole, you know, the whole blood. So okay, right, and uh, and of course the um, presence of maternal cells is that's a different issue, but it it does show um, that the degree of immunodeficiency is profound, and so there are cases of complete the George syndrome where there's been maternal engraftment, but but um, I think those are very rare. Uh, maternal engraftment would make me much more worried that this baby is going to need definitive therapy, um, including with a, a, a bone marrow transplant, but I would really wanna look at that thymus function first. I think the diabetic embryopathy associated with diabetes turns out to be um, quite possible here. I think a lot of people mentioned um, uh, syndromes with other features, but your normal head size and um, lack of of cranial dysmorphic features, uh, in my mind, rule out a lot of those. Um, and uh, we may not know what what the diagnosis of this very interesting case is. Okay, thank you guys for um, everybody's insight. Can I, and, and can, I add, can I add one thing only? Yeah. There is an interesting gene which is called EYA1. Uh, that gene actually is very important for um, not only formation of the thymus enlarge, but also the, the parathyroids, as well as the kidney and vertebrae. So I see many abnormalities that no cases reported in humans, but in mice, you do get actually all of these abnormalities with EYA1 uh, deletion. Okay. Um, okay, great. Thank you guys for your insight. Um, and I guess one more final thing is uh, remember that very rare cases can have more than one disease. And so uh, trying to find a unifying diagnosis for all this is very important. But in fact, it might actually be more than one dis underlying disorder, too. Okay. We will all keep our differentials broad. <laughs> Thank you for your expertise. Okay, we're gonna move on to our second case. Um, and unfortunately, Hannah was supposed to moderate this case, but um, but got the flu. And so um, she asked me to help um, moderate her case, which is also a very interesting case. The presenter is Caitlin Mol uh, Molchik. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> Um, from the University of Nebraska, and her senior mentor is Gigi Notarangelo from the NIH. Um, hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm an MD-PhD student at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and I just wanted to say thank you to Gigi and Kelly for taking time to help me with this case. Um, 
let's get started. So initial presentation, we have a two-week-old female who was admitted for eval of abnormal trex. Uh, her birth history is pretty normal, uncomplicated pregnancy, normal prenatal care, first-time mom. Um, she did have notable um, small gestational, or she was small for gestational age. So she was only in the seventh percentile. Um, the only notable family history was dad had MS. There was no consanguinity noted. So then um, at the hospital, we of course did a workup and her labs, we look at her um, absolute lymphocyte count, pretty low and her T cells are notably low. Her B cells are normal. Her NK cells are showing um, a pretty significantly high value there. Um, when we did the lymphocyte proliferation to mitogens assay, it was normal. She has pretty decent quantitative immunoglobulins, no evidence of maternal engraftment, and her chest x-ray showed a small present thymus. And then while she was in the hospital, she observed good growth. So I think this is a good spot to be thinking of a differential. You guys want to talk about that for a minute? A pretty fast background. Go back to the previous slide. I think it's yeah. better. Yeah. yeah, I can do that for sure. What do people think? Is this a skid? Yeah, that's it, 48 to well, 50 percent. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so Carl's asking is uh, he's commenting on this very odd 50-50 memory naive phenotype, <laughs> which is a very unusual breakdown, I think, as well. Yeah, it's 45 RA. It's 45 oh. RA. Yes, that's correct. Thank you for pointing that out. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. But I think Carl was talking about the 48%, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Maybe. So um, Carl's suggestion was maybe a CD45 mutation. Okay. You want to say anything, Kathleen, about CD45 deficiency? Um, I do not know much about that. Well, there are very few cases reported, but the phenotype is not entirely consistent with this. Okay. So I think um, if we're, we can move on to maybe further testing, if there's anything that you think we should be testing for next, if anyone has any ideas. Well, let, let's talk about this differential diagnosis they are still putting up here. Oh. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to shuffle back. So we have other TB, T, uh, T minus B positive, NK positive, skid phenotypes. Um, so go, back, go back again one slide. Go back one slide. Yeah. Again, as Dr. Pak uh, uh, mentioned previously, there are criteria for defining typical skid, and with 570 T cells, as long as these are actually the patient's own T cells. So we haven't talked about, but it does say that there is no evidence of maternal engraftment. That number is a little bit too high to define a typical skid. So that would not be consistent with a typical skid. Um, there were other hypotheses. Um, I think a seven receptor was mentioned. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, uh, same story. So if it is a typical skid, you would expect actually a much lower number of T cells. A typical skid can be all over the place. Uh, and in some cases, even proliferation to mitogens uh, may even be normal, although in most cases it's still subnormal, abnormal. Um, but this doesn't really meet any criteria for a certain diagnosis of skid at this point. It is clearly, it is clearly a condition of T-cell lymphopenia. This we mm -hmm. can all agree. Luciano um, suggested possible leaky skid. Yes. Um, I will say, you know, the proliferation of normal to mitogens is, would be unusual in that, I think. 
Yeah, but you can't you can't rule it out. I think it's it's fair to still keep it in a differential diagnosis and a typical skid in these cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. let's let's, let's move, move on. on. Okay. So further testing, I'm sure we would all want to do genetic testing. If there was any others that we want to talk about, we can throw that in too. Um, of course, we also wanted to do genetic testing, but um, it wasn't covered under the patient's insurance, and it would have been a cash price of about four to five thousand dollars. So um, we decided to wait on that, and we didn't know about Invite until later on, where you can get cheaper genetic testing through them. So then um, our next question is, would you initiate prophylaxis for this patient or would you observe this patient? So let's see what people think. Yeah. Um, Lenora saying yes. I'm not sure yes. if yes. Yes. <laughs> prophylaxis <laughs> or observation. Or yes, or observation. Lenora, clarify yourself. <laughs> I think with, uh, she says okay. yes to prophylaxis. Yes. Okay. And oh, observation. Okay. The CD4 well. count was like 500 and something, correct? Um, so it was four or three. 367. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, we measure. That's a good point. Yeah. Which <laughs> direction we're going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good call. And actually. Um, so I can discuss what we did if we have any more. Um, Lenora, the proliferation was normal. Yeah. Carl's asking about any um, granulocytopenia or thrombocytopenia. I was not given that information. Yeah. Okay. Hannah's on there. She says no yeah. other cytopenias. Okay. Yeah. So. What we decided to do for this patient is um, we decided the parents were pretty reliable. Oh, she's adding a little bit more on there. The parents were reliable. CD3 count was over 300 as long as the parents were on board to do protective isolation and not have any sick contacts around the kiddo that they were free to go home. They did live kind of far away from Omaha, so we made sure that this plan was known by both sides, the doctors and the parents. And there, we didn't know. There, there was an important point that was mentioned by Ami Rawat that, you know, was asking whether mom had been taking any immunosuppressive agents. Um, so Hana says there weren't any medications besides yeah. prenatal. But it is a good question. It's something you have question. to in these cases, yes. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Definitely. Uh, make sure of people who would prophylax and other people who would observe. And I think I would do both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I agree with Lenora. <laughs> I think there's good points on both. Um, we decided to just observe, not prophylax. Um, so let's move on with the patient timeline. So at six months of age, the patient was evaluated OSH for a fever and was diagnosed with HHV6 meningitis. Fortunately, she recovered without incident and um, didn't have any complications there. We had a follow-up visit at Children's Hospital in Omaha, and the T-cell counts were improved. Um, but overall, there was poor growth seen in her with some disproportionate length. And um, we got to use a really fun physical exam measurement, so the arm scan measurement. Um, and this is just a quick look at her growth charts. So I know it's really, really small, but the first one is length to age. And we can see that she's kind of following her own, her own little growth curve there. And then the next one is weight in the middle. Um, and she's got a little growth curve going on. But when we look at the weight to length proportion, it's, it's pretty high. Um, so her weight is pretty high for her length. And that kind of gives us a little bit of a tip off that Maybe things aren't going the way we want. Um, so an arm scan measurement, just as a brief little description, is you raise your arms to the horizontal plane and you measure from the tip of the middle finger on one hand across to the other hand and you compare the arm span to the length. And if it's 
approximately equal. There's some differences in children versus adults. It's normal. Um, and then if the arm span is greater, we think lengthening of the upper extremities, which leads us to a differential of like Marfan syndrome. And if the arm span is less than the length, then we start thinking about uh, skeletal dysplasias. So just in this little picture on the bottom from this article, um, C is actually the one that they found to be the best way to measure it, where you have the horizontal lines behind the kiddos, and then you can mark it off just to make sure that everything's um, parallel to the ground. So what we found was our kid had um, an arm span of less than her length. So we moved forward with a skeletal survey, and this is her skeletal survey. So she has rhizomelic and mesomelic long bone shortening significantly below the 10th percentile for her age. She has mild metaphysial flaring at the distal femurs, but otherwise um, normal metaphyses and epiphyses. So getting okay, stopped for a second, Luciano had actually suggested cartilage apoplasia as a possibility. It's definitely a good thought. Yeah, that's a great question. Do we have normal hair under a microscope? <laughs> Right. So we're going to talk about that. Sergio, you know, wants to know about your cutting of the hair. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I don't think that was performed, actually, but I did find some really cool pictures online when I Googled it. Or what that looks like. Um, so we do have CHH on our differential. Um, and we also have Schimke's immunoosseous dysplasia. So they both deal with different genes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm in, I'm in, I'm right now here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, with shim keys, we're looking at short stature due to flattened vertebrae, shortened neck lordosis, thymic dysfunction, and T cell lymphopenia. And then the major complication for those patients is uh, renal failure. But you know, let, let me say one thing there because I, yes, Amy uh, Ravat is actually also pointed out that there is nephropathy associated with a Shimke. But importantly, the nephropathy actually is progressive. So you may not have immediately signed oh. renal dysfunction. So at this age, you may or may not see it. Uh, okay. It's something to monitor. So you really need genetic testing to make a diagnosis there. Mm -hmm. And then um, cartilage hair hypoplasia is with RMRP which um, is interesting because it's a non-coding RNA that attaches to proteins and forms a complex, which they found to be important in DNA replication in the mitochondria. Um, and then we've talked about some clinical findings such as the hair, hypopigmentation, dental abnormalities, and then immunodeficiencies and a metaphysial chondrodysplasia. And then patients with CHH are at risk for ear, sinus, and respiratory infections, severe varicella infections, autoimmune disorders, some types of cancers, such as leukemia and lymphoma, and then um, celiac disease may develop in those. Certainly, may I ask, do you see any signs of um, any abnormal bowel movements? Uh, because the other thing that is ear sprung mm -hmm. disease. Um, I don't believe there were, but we can let Dr. Niebuhr respond for that. Okay. Um, Luciano was, everybody's getting in your head, Gigi. Everybody's suggesting it at the exact same time you are. But Luciano was asking about Hirschsprungs. Luis has asked about some radiosensitivity. Um, right, but, but we also got the answer that there were no abnormalities. Yes. No yeah. abnormalities in stool. So basically no abnormalities in the hair, no abnormalities in the stool. Would people still think that this could be CHH or probably not? I think less likely, right? Yeah, but that's that's the beauty of medicine, yeah. actually. Right, genetic <laughs> tasting, right? <laughs> and especially of this disease. <laughs> Any other autoimmunity, Hannah? No autoimmunity. Okay. okay, so let's see what it is. So we were able to do some genetic testing. And through in vitro, we yeah. found that was a homozygous pathogenic missense mutation in RMRP. So it is CHH. Wonderful. Yes. And then um, I did find a suggested management plan for patients with CHH. So sometimes they're not found on the newborn screening, so they kind of follow the same 
um, path that we did just looking at their um, lymphocytes and proliferation. Um, and then, of course, the next thing we need to think about is how do we vaccinate these children? And um, that's just in that second kind of bullet point area of the big top box. Okay, so that, because we're going to discuss this before we go to the vaccination, because that's a yeah. very interesting point. Let yeah. me just point out that there is extreme variability in the phenotype associated with CHH when it comes to immunological abnormalities. Right. Most of the other phenotypes, actually, what is not present in this child, which is the hair abnormality, and yes, this patient does have skeletal dysplasia, those are typical features, but the immunological abnormalities can be extremely variable. So a CHH is um, more common in some ethnic groups, like in, uh, in the Finnish population, and there are very, very few cases of severe T-cell lymphopenia among the CHH patients in Finland. Most of them do share the same mutation, which is a 70A to G, um, but they don't have a typically severe immunological abnormalities. By contrast, actually, there have been several cases of, even of typical skid seen in, uh, in the U.S. with newborn screening um, associated with CHH. So we don't quite understand yet why there is such a phenotypic variability. And you're absolutely right that one should not necessarily rule out CHH based on the lack of hair abnormalities, not even based on the lack of skeletal abnormalities, because there have been some cases that did not have short stature, did not have typical features of uh, skeletal dysplasia, and yet we're mutated in CHH. So it's clearly part of the differential diagnosis of all of these cases, and really genetic testing tells you. Yeah. Let's see what happens with a vaccination, because that's a very interesting point you're making here. Okay. So um, our patient has a T-cell lymphocyte uh, immunodeficiency, and it's just partial defect because it's still working when we put it under the mitogen test. Um, so contraindicated for her are all of the live vaccinations, and then they have some risk-specific recommendation recommended vaccines in the pink book here. Um, but the effectiveness of all of these vaccines definitely depend on the degree of immunosuppression our uh, patients have. And expert opinion often sets the guidelines of it's okay to give attenuated vaccines if the CD3 count is above 750 or the CD3 count is above 500 with a CD8 count of above 300 and normal proliferation to mitogens. Uh, but even if you give these children vaccinations, um, there can be sequelae, of course. And one of them for the MMR vaccination is some of these patients are seeing chronic rubella granulomas, and there's a paper out on that that you can um, look up. So that's just a sequelae that you can see. But whether we're giving these patients vaccines or not, we also need to think about who they're coming in contact with. And it's recommended that all of the people that these children are around should be vaccinated, except for like the live oral polio vaccine. But um, herd immunity is what these children really depend on. And because we've had just public uh, mistaken beliefs that because uh, diseases are gone, we don't really need to give vaccine, vaccines anymore, or maybe there's a suspicion that they could cause severe side effects such as autism, which has a lack of scientific evidence and an overwhelming amount of evidence on the contrary, um, these issues are coming about more. And so there's a great point that the Medical Advisory Committee of the Immune Deficiency Foundation brings up in their paper entitled Recommendations for Live Viral and Bacterial Vaccines and how revolutionary vaccines are for diseases in general, um, what the example they give is pertussis. So the pertussis vaccine was first introduced in the 1940s, and prior to that, there were hundreds of thousands of cases of pertussis. And then after the vaccine was introduced, it fell to 5,000, which is really dramatic. Um, but starting in the 1990s, we've been having an upward rise of 41 plus thousand cases per year in the U.S. And this is attributed to those mistaken beliefs I just talked about a second ago. Um, either way, the way this is trending, we need to start thinking about new recommendations for immunization schedules for adults and children. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of young infants 
largely in unvaccinated communities coming down with pertussis and other vaccine preventable diseases. And it really puts our immunocompromised children at a major disadvantage without that herd immunity, which I'm sure you guys all know, but that's what I wanted to talk about there. Any other comments about vaccination? The specific problem that you are raising though is about measles, right? If you go to the Yes, we will be talking about measles. Oh, because we are running out of time, so maybe... Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, try and maybe five more minutes at most. We are right here. This is our last slide. So vaccine decisions, the family decided they wanted to wait until two, but unfortunately in their small town, there was a, or a month outbreak that occurred in the town. So what are our options for this patient and how should we proceed knowing that there are some sequelae to MMR and what our patient's lymphocyte counts are. Okay, any thoughts from the audience? Um, I think her proliferation was normal uh, right. when Laura was asking about that. And so Luciana suggested passive immunity with IVIG or sub QIG would probably be a great but, option. <laughs> there was another interesting suggestion, actually something we've been discussing within PADDC to give the varicella vaccine first. And the reason for that is that there is treatment available for varicella. So if you have mm -hmm. actually um, an abnormal response to the varicella vaccine and you develop um, vaccine type varice uh, vaccine strain varicella, you can treat it. And that would actually tell you that you should not give the measles, uh, mumps, rubella. Uh, it, unfortunately, against mumps is not so much of an issue, but measles would be an issue. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, actually it's a life threatening issue. And there is little you can do about measles, by the way. So I, mm -hmm. I, I actually like the idea of uh, using a varicella vaccine in such cases before you give the measles uh, vaccine. Mm -hmm. Carl was asking about the RARO um, ratio, and it looks like, Carl, at age two months, they're a little bit less than they were previously. Um, and so the, ratio, the ratio is more or less. Yeah. But you see the number of T cells over time has increased. Yeah. That maybe, you know, there is a decline yeah, at a very yeah. low time point. That's also often seen in CHH. Many of these patients actually spontaneously improve their T cell count over time. And that is reassuring when it comes to, you know, proceeding with vaccines. But again, I would be, I would be cautious. I would first use a vaccine against which you can do something. Yeah. Uh, I think the varicella is actually a better choice than uh, proceeding directly with measles, mumps, or rubella. And so, do you wait, Gigi, like a month, or do you? Um, you so you get you give the vaccine if there is no reaction. If the if the child doesn't develop any reaction, then yes, then you proceed. You know, like after one month or two months, and then you okay. give the measles, mumps, or rubella. Carl's asking about rotavirus. If the kid had any problems with rotavirus, or if they got rotavirus vaccine. Um, as far as I know, they weren't doing any vaccines until right. age two. Yeah. Okay. Probably because of the T-cell infobenia. Yeah, rotavirus was held is what it says. Okay. Mm -hmm. So their infectious disease team, immunology team, and PCP agreed to admit the patient because they did live outside of Omaha. And the parents were given the options between vaccination or IVIG, and the parents opted to go with a dose of IVIG as pre-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, insurance refused to cover this too, which is kind of a battle to deal with. Um, but the luckily, the month outbreak resolved within three months, and um, the parents decided to stick with the plan to vaccinate at two. Uh, but sooner, if there was another outbreak that happened in the town. But I think it's a great case, and unfortunately, it's something that we have to think about because now that we're seeing more and more often um, a decline in vaccine coverage, uh, we're going to see many more cases like this. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing um, that will have to be thought about is if you do give children IVIG, how soon can you give them a vaccine? I think that's another question that's up. And they do have some recommendations out on that. Um, Sabia is asking it, Gigi about your, your um, recommendation for the staged approach of varicella and then moving uh, on to MMR. Do you actually check antibodies to see if they respond? Yes, you do. Yes. Okay. You do. Yeah. Okay. So the answer is check antibodies. And then Carl commented after high dose IVIG, they wait 11 months. Granted, I'm sure you were just giving replacement doses here. So yeah. Yeah. 
on yeah. that. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Case. Thank you, everyone. Great case. And then I just had a quick citation. Okay, thank you so much for that interesting case. We had some great management discussions tonight. Um, if people have three more minutes with me, uh, with us, we have a quick brief article review from an article that came out. We try to pick like a hot article that com came out in the, within the month of the webinar. Um, and Hannah had picked this article and she just sent me her slide. So I'm going to quickly go through it. Um, uh, I am going to acknowledge I haven't read this article yet, <laughs> but I uh, had read the abstract previously. Um, Anyway, so the idea is this recently came out. We're trying to teach some pearl um, from the article that you can take away. Um, <laughs> so pulmonary disease burden and primary immune deficiency disorders, looking at the USID net registry and seeing what we can learn from that. Next slide. Um, where's the next slide? Button? Here we go. Uh, so the background is lung disease we know is all is common in many PIDs and it can occur in various ways, recurrent infection, chronic lung disease, bronchiectasis, interstitial lung disease. It can be obstructive airway stuff like asthma. We can get malignancy and other autoimmune disease. Um, but there's limited information about what we need to know, think about from a lung standpoint in our primary immune deficiencies. And most studies are limited to one specific disease. So um, this was a retrospective analysis of pulmonary disease from the USID net registry. PIDs were divided into 10 categories um, and um, PHI was excluded. Um, pulmonary disease was then divided into five type categories and procedures and therapeutics were also looked at for pulmonary procedures. CVID used as a reference category was due to its higher prevalence in the USID net database. So specifically, the categories we're looking at are AGAM, combined immune deficiency, complement immune dysregulatory syndromes, isolated antibody deficiencies or isotype, innate defects, phagocytic defects, SCID, CVID, and thymic defects. And then the disease categories for lung diseases is an airway disease, is parenchymal disease, pleural disease, vascular disease, or other. And um, as we can see, uh, in general, lung disease is quite common among all of these, but immune dysregulation um, and uh, antibody deficiency, um, as well as NA defects, were all like 50% of these, um, which is important to comp note. Obviously, also CVID was the most prevalent with um, pulmonary manifestations. And then specifically looking at prevalence of airway disease versus parenchymal disease. Um, in uh, airway disease, sorry, CVID is the most um, prevalent, whereas in an antibody, isolated antibody and isotype disease was the second most prevalent, in a defects third. And here when looking at parenchymal lung disease, again, we have CVID and we have immune dysregulatory disorders. So that's something obviously to think about as we think about ILD and then innate defects. Um, and then looking at diagnostic pulmonary procedures, vascular procedures, and therapeutic pulmonary procedures. Um, this is kind of hard because of all the gray shading, but um, um, thymic defects has a little bit more of these vascular procedures, it looks like, or other or vascular procedures and therapeutic procedures. Um, and CVID has a good amount of all of these. I don't know. This one's hard for me to figure out because of the colors. But um, AGAM, I'm not really sure what these other procedures are, so we'll have to look into that. Um, and then conclusions. The most prevalent um, pulmonary diseases were seen in CVID, and that was both airway and parenchymal disease. Those were both mo the most common. Um, most procedures were diagnostic, um, but there is a possible role for more therapeutic procedures. Oxygen therapy was most commonly used in the uh, immune regulatory disorders. And then further guidelines are needed on monitoring diagnosis and management. That is it. Thank you for joining us for this hour of education.